thank you very much for that warm welcome and th thank you to Aaron and the Pluralsight team for all the work our two companies do together. Now, one of the great luxuries in being in a technology company is that you get to invent the future every day. And technology allows you to change what your company can be because you can write software, create new products, and change what you mean to companies and people around the world. Now, technology transformation gives companies that chance to build a tomorrow that's better for themselves than their past. You know, and when, that's one of the amazing things about technology is that it allows companies to change their future and not just be in this category of business, but to change what they mean to their customers. Now, to do that successfully, though, you, is a complicated process because you know, people are worried about the future, the, the problem with technology changing all the time, you have to make bets without all the information that you need to make bets. Some people are worried about, are we going to be just as successful in the future as we have been in the past. And so a lot of our lessons over the last several years transforming Oracle to the age of cloud computing has been about leading people through that transition. Now, the first lesson we learned was to get engineers in a company motivated about the future and about building products that change the future. It can't be about money, it can't be about revenue or shareholder value or anything of the kind. You know, it's got to be about a mission to change how technology can help other people. And you have to imagine the future before the future is there because it's your job to invent that future. So as an example, you know, our technology was used by large corporate customers who had a lot of resources uh, that they could apply in order to run, manage, operate the machines that run our software and also operate our software. And so 10 years ago, we said, could you imagine that a student in a school in South Africa, in a small underprivileged neighborhood in South Africa, could sit down at their phone sign in, entering their name and password, and be able to create a system on the fly. And they'd not have to have a computer, they'd not have a data center, they wouldn't need to have a database administrator, they wouldn't need operationally skilled people, because everything would be delivered in a new way, and it would all operate by itself, because our software would manage itself. That was, at that time, people said, are we all gone crazy? Is that even possible? It's possible, and there are people doing that today. Second thing we thought about was, you know, many people use our software, and we said most people find using business applications, entering orders, approving hiring, looking at all those things extremely cumbersome. We said, imagine you could just talk to the system, and you could say, approve all the purchase orders that came from this company today. So the lesson in that is to, to lead people through this change, you have to give them a vision of what you're going to enable people to do with the work they're putting in, in a fundamentally different way than was possible. And because you're inventing the future, you have to invent it before it's there. And that requires people to be comfortable with uncertainty, because you are inventing it and you don't have the future as tangible and available right in front of them. Now, technology also takes many years to mature. So when, when you build software, we look at it on two dimensions, things that we're doing over two to three years and things that we're doing over 10 years. So 10 years from now, for example, we think every machine, every human being, every customer will have a fully digital representation. 
and software will remember everything about them. What they like to do, what information they need, when have they lost talk to your company, what role do they have in an organization, and we'll serve it all up for them without having them have to re-enter all this information. Every time you call a contact center, today you have to identify yourself. Who are you? What's, what do you do? When are you traveling? All that information is available. It's so when we look 10 years out, you have to imagine things that are not possible because it takes that much time to build the technology and mature it. And the biggest risk you have is your people are not thinking far enough ahead to give you time to mature that technology. Now, leading then becomes a little complicated because how do you measure the success of something where you're inventing something that's not yet real and where you need six or seven years to mature it? And so from our point of view, what we do is we look at a different set of metrics to measure projects that are incremental improvements on existing products versus things that are long range. And you have to get people to believe that the organization values not just the immediate term, where you're getting revenue from products that you're incrementally improving, but where you're making breakthroughs. Now, to invest in a breakthrough is a very diff different thing than investing in something that you're incrementally improving, because incremental improvements are tangible, you can have customers talk to you about it, you can understand what they need, and you can deliver it. Many people have asked us, how do you actually, what's the hardest thing in leading a long-term change? And that is, I would tell you, the hardest thing is really listening to customers. And because customers tell you what they think is within the realm of possibility, right? They don't tell you what is really possible because they haven't been able to invent it. And it's your job as a technology company to invent that. So when, let's take a really mundane example, an extraordinarily mundane example. Many of you may have traveled here. If you work at a company, when you go back, you have to file an expense report. Yes? <laughs> How many of you say, I really love filing my expense report? <laughs> Very few people have ever told me the two things I'm still waiting for, a day when somebody tells me I love patching Oracle databases <laughs> and I love filing expense reports. So for expense reports, for example, you know, the thing we, we're working on is something. So if you ask a normal customer, do you think, can, how do you like filing expense reports? They'll say, I hate it. But you say, can you ever imagine a world where you don't have to file an expense report? And they say, what are you talking about? I have to file an expense report to get money back. Right? That's the only reason you file an expense report. So he said, suppose we make it completely touchless. You take your phone, touch your contacts. We know who you're meeting with. Take a picture of the receipt if you had dinner at a restaurant. Character recognition will parse it. You talk to your phone and say, I had lunch with so-and-so today, and you're done. And no customer would tell you that's what I'd really like to do because they don't know that it's possible. What they're going to tell you is, I really don't like filing expense reports. And it's your job as a developer to imagine what could be possible with all the new technologies that are coming on to solve the problem. And that's what leading to change requires, because you have to enable people in your organization to understand how to listen. And how to listen, because many people hear you, and they literally transcribe what you're saying without really trying to understand what is it you really want as opposed to what is it you really are telling me. Because you may not be able to, t unless you really listen, you're not able to understand what are they really saying. And lastly, when you're going 10 years out, there's a lot of uncertainty. Do you know if voice is going to be a technology that's truly able to un, like, be translated with 100% fidelity in 10 years? Possibly. Did you know that phones would be so popular as the primary device people use to talk to the internet and to do all of their work today? 10 years ago, I don't think people would have said, 
everybody in the world is going to have a smartphone, and that's going to be the internet device. But you have to make a decision, because if you're paralyzed in making a decision, engineers struggle with, what should we do? Should we do this, or should we do that? And so the important thing is being comfortable listening to people as a manager and facilitating in the organization a way for people to make decisions with uncertainty. That's particularly hard being an engineer myself. I'm, I can tell you engineers love to get 100% of the data before they make a decision. Right? They're like, hey, do you think this, we should do this? Can I get some more data? Um, no, you're not going to get any more data. Well, then I'm really uncomfortable making that decision. And what they're really not, what they're uncomfortable with is actually not making the decision. They're worried about making the wrong decision. And so that becomes the next thing. When you're making long-term decisions, you will make some mistakes. And it's more important to have an organization that makes, at least from our point of view, if you don't have 10% of your products failing, it means you're not pushing hard enough. You have to have a certain number of products fail because that's part of having an organic process of building technology. And if you're 100%, if your goal is to get 100% of products succeeding, it means you're not making enough bets. And so what I tell people is, it's okay to fail. All you did was you made a decision and the market went a different direction. You can course correct your decision and even if it's a fundamental mistake, it's all right. Part of our job is to facilitate people, to encourage them to make decisions without having all the data. And to balance the data that they have with the data that they don't have. Because often, you know, you tend to weight factors that you have data for higher because you're uncomfortable with uncertainty. Lastly, an organization, if your future changes every day, you have to an organization that learns every day and learns how to make changes, how to learn from failures, and how to be a creative organization. And that's part of the work we've done with Plural Sight, and that's part of the work we're doing with many, many organizations around the world. You know, I'll give you just a couple of examples of things we're really, really proud of. Last year, we sent some people into Kabul in Afghanistan to give, ironically, a hackathon about blockchain to young women in Afghanistan who never had access to technology. And we did it because we wanted to show people that new technology can change the world and can change the world and make it accessible to everybody, even those who never have access to technology. If when, when you know, the Ebola virus became a big problem in Africa, the World Health Organization asked us, you know, we just don't have enough doctors and we're having a hard time recruiting them fast enough to be able to dispatch them. And we said we should never have that problem again. So today they use our technology and they have a global database of doctors who they can call in on any individual issue. And that, those examples encourage our employees to build the future. Because it's more about the mission than about changing the world through technology than about any individual product that they're working on. And we're super proud and pleased that Aaron and his team have helped us bring a lot of this learning within our organization. We use Pluralsight and also bring it to all those developers who we know and love around the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>